should be going on. We are live. Good. All right. Okay. We are live. Now, let's kick off this class. Welcome to our second virtual newborn class. Um, my name is May. This is a little bit of a unique situation as we adjust to our quote unquote new normal for the newborn class. Usually we do this in person and I love it because I get to see all of your beautiful faces um, and expecting mothers, which is very, very fun because um, I can remember you guys when we, uh, whenever I see you guys at the newborn visit. Um, we're Please bear with me. We are doing almost like a placebo as we kick off this class again. I, I ran it one month ago and we're troubleshooting some technical issues and we're gonna do it again. One of the common things that I've learned from our last first virtual class is that we have some feedback such as questions from anything that I discuss or I raise in this class, um, please feel free to leave them in the comment section and let me know that you're here. Um, it's a good interaction that we can have. That's one of the drawbacks of having a virtual because with live Facebook courses, they're about roughly a couple minutes delayed. So I can have a parent that joins um, a couple minutes later and they're 10 slides back at this point. Um, and so what I'm going to do is go ahead and ask your questions even if I'm already on another slide or if you're not sure if you're jumping in late um, don't worry about it I'm going to have someone actually it's my beautiful office manager Miss Leanne sitting next to me and she is going to be jotting down the answers and I will answer the questions at the end of my slides um, and if I see anything that comes up let's say um, hours after the class has concluded I will be happy to address your questions on on the comment section as well. So the chances are if you have a question, someone else probably has a similar question. And then we can tackle that and I just asked for, you probably should get a response on Facebook that you're, um, there's a comment in response to your comment. All right, so again, my name is May. I am the pediatric nurse practitioner here at Einstein Pediatrics and I welcome you to our virtual online class for the newborn class. Um, congratulations to everyone. And I call this expecting the unexpected. Much of life is unexpected and I think it's even more relevant today with what's going on. Um, but without further ado, let's. Let's jump into the course. Okay, I firmly believe that we should date each other before we marry each other, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about us. Um, so I, uh, Albert, uh, not Albert Einstein, but Einstein Pediatrics was really found after um, Dr. Martin founded this practice almost three years ago, I believe, um, and he came from a prior practice, which was um, and wanted to come with this new aspect of a more intimate um, relationship with the patient. So we really don't go past four providers. This way, your baby does not run through 20 different opinions. Um, and you kind of have that interpersonal relationship with the providers that you come across and you don't really scramble through a running mill of people, which is very nice. As you can see, um, Dr. Martin went to Albert Einstein College of Medicine. That's where we got our name, Einstein Pediatrics. I like to call it very punny. Um, I completed my master's degree from University of Pennsylvania and I worked in cardiac intensive care unit at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia for almost four years. So cardiology is at my heart and I love my CARDS patient. I love all my patients. Um, this is only to tell you that we're highly involved in medical societies. Um, so a good example is we are active in the Medical Society of Virginia where we connect and like to get to know the specialists that we refer you out to. There's a lot of specialists in Northern Virginia. And we don't just want to refer you out to anyone. We kind of get to, want to know their protocols, their experience, um, and get to know them a little bit and find reputable specialists. Um, so that's very helpful. We are also very active in the American Academy of Pediatrics. Dr. Martin is the vice president of the Virginia chapter. Um, and this is basically where all the protocols, the policies, the treatments for pediatric care comes from, is birthed from, um, and it's very highly important, all the developmental to vaccines, to medication for ear infections, um, and so it's important that we're um, very active in, in the AAP as well, that's what it's um, short term called. Um, 
I know the Children's Hospital, you'll see um, Maria, actually, Dr. Rittenbach just graduated from their residency program. She's amazing. Um, she's board certified pediat pediatrician, and she just recently joined our office. And um, no, not even recently, a year. Time goes by so quickly. Um, and so there's actually four different providers. You can see all of this on our website under the Meet Your Staff, um, and you'll get to know a little bit of more information about each one of us. Um, I like to call it the six degree of separation. I joined Dr. Martin, I believe, two years into the, running the practice. It was very nice to work hip and hip by hip by him um, and getting to know his thought process and everything. So we have monthly, if not even sooner, weekly meetings about our patient care, new policies in place, and we're always striving to improve and be better um, because we believe that there's always margins for improvement and that's what um, brings the best outcome and the safest practice to our patients. Um, and you'll also get to know Dr. Segura since I mentioned Dr. Rittenbach anyways. Um, she, I met her at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia South Philly site. So when I knew she was moving home, she would fit like a glove with our practice. So you don't branch more than four different uh, pediatric provider opinions. And if anything, we sit down all the time and make sure that our care is consistent and also conclusive. Um, and we, any complicated patients, we always sit around a table and discuss it um, before we take leads on any type of big decisions that we have to make. Okay, so that's a little bit about us. Now, let's go on to the next slide. I will say this, you can have the best memory, even photographic memory, and know every textbook, score the high score on your boards, whatever it might be, it always runs short of the experience itself. I like to say that you guys are on the left side of the field right there with all the chicken nuggets, their little itsy bitsy spiders, super cute. Every year brings a different uh, blessing and challenge. Um, and so we're gonna focus a little bit on the newborn period and you guys will end up being the ex experts. You will be the best person that knows your child the most, okay? Um, this photograph is really just to say that we are a small provider panel office to get to know you guys best um, so that we can watch your child grow. We want to see them from infancy until they head off for college. We want to look for that long marriage run and not that short dating course. So get to know our practice a little bit. Right now, the biggest questions a lot of my newborn mamas and papas or parents have is, how is your practice running in the COVID-19 pandemic? And that is an excellent question. Usually during normal norms, although what's normal, right guys? Um, normal, before the pandemic, if you will, um, we had prolonged hours, meaning we had longer office hours um, and Mondays and Thursday, we ran from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. As of right now, now this is fluid practice, right? So it changes every day. We, not every day, but almost every single week, we learn something new about different and changing of policies run by the government to what's safest for our patients. So tentatively, as of this week, um, a week or two before May, we, st we have shortened our hours to keep everyone safe. Um, we run from 7 a.m. until 3 p.m., Mondays till Fridays. When regular hours will be reinstated, um, whenever that will be, we're learning about this novel virus as time goes on, we're hoping that we can expand our office hours back to regular times um, with longer days, 7, to 8, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Monday and Thursdays, and our Saturday office hours as well, which is usually every other, but as of right now, we are holding that off um, to keep you guys safe to lessen exposure. Um, our newborns are always seen. Um, here's the biggest feedback I get from my newborn parents. Well, may we have to come into the office. How does that look like in the circumstance that we're in right now with what's going on in the community? That is such a good question. Um, we, I, I like to say that you have to be the president or the CIA to get into our office. We scan everyone. We're very, very sneaky ninjas. Um, so we check your temperature for when you come in. Um, we make sure that you are symptom free from any COVID-19 correlated symptoms from fever, cough, shortness of breath, diarrhea, vomiting, anything of that sort that might be suggestive of even an asymptomatic carrier and also any type of exposures two weeks beforehand. We do this bifold process. Process. So we call the day before. In addition to that, we screen you one more time at the door when we look at you. 
and then we also do the temperature checks. Every single room is wiped down after every patient care, um, and because of the limited hours, we are only seeing well patients in the office. We have a separate space and time for any type of insinuated sick visits, um, if you will. It, it could be, simply even be I have a allergic reaction, or not allergic reaction, I have allergies or something, then we, we still, just in case, because of the runny nose, don't bring you into the office. And those are the extreme measures that we are taking to keep you and your baby safe, okay? Um, so we do all those things just to make sure um, but newborns are definitely being seen in our office and they have three allocated rooms where only newborns go into so absolutely nobody else and uh, over the age of um, two months and older can go into that room all right so and we wipe down every room with Clorox bleach and we turn it over every single time every person that you come into contact with has new gloves and we're always masked all the time and we wipe everything down from our instruments to our laptops to the room itself so those are the reassuring measures that we have right now that is unique to the context that we are living in in such a time as this Oh, and if you have any questions about that, please don't hesitate to leave in the comment section. I will be happy to answer them. All right. So this photograph to all my Star Wars fan is for how I think the health insurance meets, especially now. Um, it's telehealth is a, a big topic, and I, I feel like we're never we're never peacefully sitting together and having popcorn. But it's all to say we take all um, commercial. Um, insurances, HMO, PPOs. We don't do Medicaid right now, and I apologize for that. It's just contractual reasons, not because we don't want to. Um, something that we hope to troubleshoot for later on um, in practice as more contracts are being renewed. Alrighty. But if you do have Medicaid and you really want to um, be, you want to have your baby be seen in this office, we do do out-of-pocket fees. Um, I just ask that you call individually so that we can relay those costs with you. All righty. Okay, without further ado, let's embark on our newborn class. I like to say this, I'm gonna tell you where the hoops, loops, drops are gonna be, um, and you're going to know when to expect them, but it doesn't take the thrill away. You still kinda go through the drop yourself. It's not gonna take that sensation away. So um, hold, buckle up, it's gonna be quite a fun ride. This is you guys in the pink shirt. That's us in the red shirt holding you tight, making sure that you're okay. Um, the second row is you with your second child. And then the back row is your fifth child. And that's when you're gonna be teaching this course. I will tell you what to focus on um, because your baby is going to grow up so fast, a blink of an eye right in front of you. Um, so I, I want you to be reassured that I'll highlight everything that you need to know. And also, this is like a cafe shop conversation. I want you to be relaxed and enjoy this. Um, write things down, put it at the back of your pharmaceutical cabinet in the back of your brain. Um, if it's relevant, we will be talking about anything that is relevant for your baby at digestible increments at that first and incremental subsequent visits, okay? And I say this because I have great analysts and great readers, great engineers in our office, and they love data. Um, and they get really fixated on it, which is amazing, but you miss that opportunity of the sight of seeing your baby grow. How do we know this? Science even confirms this. 700 cortical synaptical pathways are being established in the first 24 months of life, two years of life. Um, and look at the amount that's being developed in that first three months of life. This is really important. And I even have um, studies, imaging studies of two three-year-old children, no, none of which are premature babies. And they both received physical and also um, their nutritional needs, but clearly only one received their um, their their attention needs. And we can see that it's the baby on the left-hand side, bigger brain size and gray, uh, gray and white myelination, which is excellent, all right? Economist even knows this, so the more you invest in the beginning periods, the prenatal periods, the better they do in the long run. Um, all this to say, well, 
May, what are you trying to tell me? What we're trying to say is routines, reading, rhyming rewards, relationships are very important. I think it's easily discounted because we fixate on measurable means. So we don't take that time to hold that baby in the beginning either. We don't take time um, to just sing to that baby, stare at that baby, do skin to skin time. That develops a cortical pathway that I was discussing before this. Um, and don't underestimate that sound that you do, whether it's the father or the, or the mother. She's that that baby's acquainted with the mama's heart. That baby's acquainted with the father's sound of his voice rubbing on that belly and they're poking at you right now. Um, and so those things really, they, when they're born, externally and outside of the utero, they recognize that. That's what they were pruned and wired to hear and they're going to latch onto that. And that physical attention is highly vital. Okay, well, I hear you may, but baby's not here yet. What do I need to know? Good, let's talk about cribs. So first thing is, um, this is such a cute crib. I have no idea where I can find it. I don't, I'm not even sure if it's a cake, to be honest. It's super cute, but it's totally not okay. Uh, maybe as a decal item in the corner. I love Shark Week too, so this is really fun to watch and maybe Jaws, um, but don't put that baby in there at night, please. I, uh, there's so simple rules. If you haven't finished nesting yet, this is a good time to nest during the pandemic. I mean, you're stuck at home anyways, right? There's some things that I want to talk about. Crib set up, so get them starting in, get that crib started. Um, I have some simple rules. Here's the easy overarching rule. The newer, the better. I don't want anything from Craigslist or eBay if you could. Things get recalled every two to three years um, because there's faults, faultiness in them. Um, so it's highly important that you check up with the recall list on the government FDA website. Um, but most of, importantly is if it's the new the better. That's number one. And here are some simple rules. All products that are for pre anywhere from prenatal up into preschool years is regulated by something called the JPMA. That's Juvenile Production Manufacturing Association. They regulate 92%, if not more, of those items. Strollers, car seats, cribs, all important things. Um, and if it doesn't have that JPMA stamp, it shouldn't be sold. Um, so if it has that, check, check, you are good to go. They go through four regulations with the JPMA. They make sure that, you don't have to memorize this, by the way, they just make sure that the railings in between one another is two to three eighth inches apart. They make sure that from the mattress up into the top of the railing is about 26 inches, roughly at that point. No, it should be 26 inches um, so that you can reach the baby and also the baby can't elope. So for longevity use, so that baby can't climb out and jump off, if you will, um, there should be absolutely nothing in that crib if it doesn't come with it, meaning no bumpers. That chicken nugget can roll 90 degrees. So when you're sleeping, you're exhausted, you just pushed a baby out, who knows how long that labor was and if you're up probably your counterpartner your partner was also up whether it's dad um and they were up with you during that delivery process you both are sleep deprived and no one's watching that baby roll to the side and they can guys even if you swaddle them and if there's a bumper there and it's right there that you can lead towards suffocation so absolutely no bumpers period so sorry um, the last piece is no slide down railings period i know that the hospital has that but that's because we're in a controlled medical setting you don't need to have that at home although i trust that whoever installs it is it's doing it with due diligence and carefulness um, i still worry about that potential of uh, faultiness where it can fall and strangulate a limb which is the last thing we need especially now um, this is much more for later on but i like to set up the crib anyways in the beginning a lot of our babies sleep in bassinets which are um more more appropriate so that any most of our patients like to breastfeed it's easier to get to that baby it's closer to mama and we don't have to move that crib because that crib should be closer to a wall it's usually set in a place um, the bassinet that i usually really love is snoo uh, it's it's very great because it you can rent it so you don't have to purchase that device because it can come up to a high economic cost um, but variable not it is not just a recommendation and something that i personally love and i know several other providers like dr sakura loves it too um, but it is not required, um, just in case if you are curious as to what bassinet we love. All right, 
so I, like I said, in the class set, setting, I like to have an interactive conversation, but we're in a unique setting right now. Uh, so I like to look at this photograph and I say, the baby is beautiful, but what's wrong with the picture? And there's usually three things that are not appropriate in this photograph. Um, and I, I, I like to always talk to you about them, but I'll just give you the answer. You guys lucked out. In the last classes, I actually pick out the fathers and I say, all right, you in red cap, what do you think the answer is to see if they're falling asleep or not? Um, clearly, no one hopefully is falling asleep right now. You're enjoying some popcorn on the couch. Uh, the four Bs are this. Bumpers, nay. Belly, nay. Baby should always be on their back. And I'll talk about that in a later slide. And last but not least, blanket. There's a blanket. Um, blanket can cause overheating. Um, I know that sometimes the household is a little bit colder. And also, we have different thresholds. Um, so I know I like the house a little bit cooler. But who knows? My sister or my mother or my whoever it is, your husband likes the house a little bit warmer. Um, but the household should usually be around 69 to 72 degrees. 73 degrees is super hot for a baby. Super hot. And then you throw a blanket on top it can cause overheating and it could lead these things that we're talking about no bumpers no belly um, and also no blanket is for a reason um, it's for, to prevent sudden infant death syndrome which is um, highly fatal so we want to do everything we can to help that baby do its best and thrive for the future right uh, but that baby may or may not be a sibling of someone in this office and I'm not going to tell who and they are alive and well thank goodness but we definitely don't want to do that okay all right next photograph woof Every time I stare at this photograph, I promise myself that I'm going to turn this photograph vertically, and I have failed to do so. So besides the fact that this photograph is horizontal, ugh, sheesh may, I will put a mental note and hopefully in the future I can get it correct. So if we are still doing a virtual appointment um, in May and you hop on and you're like, ah, that photograph is still horizontal, feel free to shoot me a gentle, friendly reminder and I will fix that photograph. This photograph is a cute baby of someone who is now a teenager and belong is, is a child of someone, clearly not mine. Um, and that baby is perfect. But there's several things that are not, that can be improved from this photograph. Um, and I usually like to take a pause and answer for questions and see what you guys are thinking. And um, I'll tell you this, a lot of parents, it's usually the dads that go, that car seat's on the floor, that's what's wrong. And you're out, or B, the baby's sleeping in the car seat and they shouldn't be. And you're correct, that's totally true. Um, but when you're traveling, some things sometimes are a little bit inevitable. Um, and so with this said, I'll tell you what can be improved from this photograph. A, see those two buckles right there? There's the bottom buckle and there's that top sternal clutch. Um, it's called sternal clutch for a reason. Um, that sternal clutch is too low. That needs to be higher. Uh, that baby, now this is a chunky monkey over here eating very well. Yeah, it, They can be itsy bitsy spiders when they're born. And when that's too low, that baby can slide out from the top. They are durable little rubber bands. They can just whoop, rub out. Um, and when you're, wh where are they usually when they're in the car seat? They're in your car. So your car's in high mobility. That that baby can slide out from the top very easily, God forbid if an accident occurs, and that's the last thing we need. So that sternal clutch, which is kind of in the lower chest area, that's horizontal, that um, long, longer uh, buckle, that needs to be scooted higher. You're not gonna choke your baby, I promise. You're not gonna choke your baby. Are they gonna cry in that position? Yes, um, and that's because for nine, eight to nine months, they've never been in that position. They're in that nice warm jacuzzi. They can move and be contained at the same time. Mom's often walking because they're very uncomfortable with this nine, eight, six, seven pounder in their belly, especially their petite. Um, and so they're kind of rocked like a, in a yoga, in the yoga ball position up and down, up and down. It's a very relaxing position for them. So when you're putting them in this kind of fixed structure to keep them alive, they're not gonna like it, not because you're choking and you're, you're, you're suffocating them by any means. So that sternal clutch needs to be scoot up. Um, that bottom clutch needs to go over the perineal area in layman terms over the vagina or the penis needs to go a little bit lower because the baby cannot sneak out, meaning they can't fall out of a car seat when it's in mobility through the center. That's too small of a space. They can only slide out from the top. So if you kind of, if you will, scoot those two buckles apart the top the sternal clutch goes higher towards the chin the bottom one goes closer towards the groin therefore if anything happens that pressure doesn't happen over the abdomen causing any internal bleeding and it's over a, a bony prominence or some cushion downstairs in the perineal region okay uh, so those are the two things the last piece is a little bit similar to the um the crib 
If it doesn't come in the car seat, you don't bring it into the car seat. I know they're small in the beginning and it seems like it's too big for them, but see that headpiece right there? I'd rather leave it out. Um, and the whole reason is when you are in high mobility, you chances are someone's driving the car and it's the mom in the back with a baby. That mama is exhausted. She just pushed for hours, was in labor for hours, or if you had C-section, you're still recovering. And so we're not as vigilant as we usually are when we get nine hours of sleep without any trauma, right? Um, and so that little piece of plastic can push downwards when that baby's sleeping and push the head forward when the car's in mobility. You close airway that way. And so we don't want airway compromise. So those are the three things I like to say, big nay-nay or could be improved from this photograph. Otherwise, that baby is super cute with chubby cheeks. Um, how do I know if my car seat's installed correctly, May? Well, you got two options. So you see that Operation Kids Child Safety Seat Inspection Hotline? That's the one place you can call. Um, the car seat to the base is pretty intuitive with anything made three years ago. It just clicks. I love it. Up a baby, Nuna baby, whatever you might have. Um, and you, it's, it's more of installing the base that is much more of my concern if it's not done correctly because that whole thing flies forward. Um, and so A, you can call this number. B, go to your, lo um, well, it's a little bit unique now. So make sure you're masked appropriately and you can go to your local fire um, fighter station to make sure someone comes out and looks and make sure that your base is uh, applied appropriately. If not, I have another idea for you. It is called the Car Seat Lady Blog. I love this resource. Memorize it, copy it, go to the website, Google it. Um, it is ran by a physician, guys, a physician who completed their neonatal intensive care unit fellowship at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. That's where I learned about it. Um, and it is an excellent free resource to all parents. You can even subscribe them. I get mails. Now, this is a pretty older uh, copy and paste from their screenshot from their website. They have a, a refined one, but they go from everything from rear facing to installation on the right click of the button. They show you videos um, and it's very helpful to know. Um, even for, there's a video, if you go to the rear facing tablet all the way to your left, um, there should be one of the earlier videos is what to do when your baby looks too small for their um, car seat. They should really be moving about one finger breadth of inch of a margin and that's it. If they're moving any more, you need to tighten the buckle and you need to tighten the, car, uh, the straps a little bit more. Um, but there's one that, follow along with me as best as you can. I usually Usually physically show this in the office but of course we have new challenges we're adapting to um, you can roll two hospital grade blankets after you buckle the baby in onto each side therefore it minim minimalizes any movement from them it's better described if you see the video in that um, you can go to that resource and nothing ever goes over the baby's head because it can roll down to the neck and push the head forward um, so please visit this resource it's amazing Okay, well, I am an A++ mom, May. I got my car seat. I got my crib. I even got my lift serve for everything that we need. Baby shower is done virtually. What do I need to know when the baby's giving birth in the hospital? Okay, some big things to know. Key factors. Babies lose weight. They lose all of the maternal bodily fluid that you give them on board and they can lose eight to ten percent and that's actually 99.9% .9 of our first couple of visits together is making sure that the baby gains back to birth weight for hydration purposes and also to make sure that they're eating enough for that appropriate growth development and brain growth that needs to occur. Two, babies sleep a lot and do not wake to feed. If that baby has been sleeping in your beautiful jacuzzi of a womb for eight to nine months, um, they're not gonna wake up to feed. They never had to lift a finger before that, before they were born to eat. And now all of a sudden, when they're out of utero, they gotta work for everything. So sucking to get milk is not normal for them to sustain for a long time and they burn calories very easily. They're living my best dream. Eating is burning calories. Um, and so it's, it's important though that you wake that baby up to feed because if you don't wake that baby up to feed, they're missing so many feeds and they continue to lose weight and they branch further than that 10% weight loss and that's when we get a little bit concerned. So you gotta wake that baby up every hmm, two to three hours. You got me, two to three hours. Um, this becomes a shocking statement to many new parents, especially the daddies, uh, where they have to wake up. What do you mean I have to wake up every two to three hours? You're absolutely correct. You have to wake up every single two to three hours. That baby grows from a chicken nugget to a chicken tender and a full on rotisserie chicken and then a chimpanzee in the blink of an eye. And in order to do that, you gotta eat. Um, and so I always say, um, once you have a baby puppy and you've raised a baby puppy, you will know how this goes. 
Number three, lactation consultants. My biggest pearl that I can give anyone who's giving birth at the hospital is um, if you're giving birth at a hospital, mama, and you want to breastfeed and that's your goal, which is 90% of our patients, if not 99% of our patients like to do that, um, my biggest recommendation is call the LC on board. The LC is a lactation consultant. That means when you're awake and that baby is stirring for a feed, call the lactation consultant, work on that latch. Your latch will be 80 to 90% of your biggest challenge in the first two weeks of life, two, three weeks of life. Um, doing that deep wide latch to help express that breast milk and to help empty those duct and express it to get that milk intake takes work. And if, if you remember what I just said a couple, a slide back, I said these kids have never sucked They've never been dependent on sucking to be fed in utero for eight to nine months. And so when they're coming out and they have to work on this new latch, it's like almost me learning how to use a chopstick to eat my food and teaching it to someone. So you have to keep working on it in the beginning in order to make sure that you're fed and you have adequate transition of food to meet those caloric needs. So call that LC when you're awake. You paid for that hospital stay anyways in that delivery utilize what you paid for. Um, so, and the other perk is in May, our beautiful lactation consultant is returning, uh, or counselors returning, Fabiola, and she's a saint. She is so great. And we will have her in house to work with you guys. Um, the one pearl is um, just be careful of when you do do call that LC in hospital because a lot of lactation consultants can bring a, a lot of cooks in a kitchen and can get messy sometimes. So. See what works best for you, football hold, cradle hold. And I want you to kind of grab on that. I want to empower you, seize with, seize that thought and say, you know what, that cra I, cradle didn't really work for me, but that football hold really worked for me, May. I want you to tell that to the next LC, okay? You know what's best for you. You know what's less painful and you know what helps the baby in the most and what makes them the most comfortable. Work on that position and then let the lactation consultant know so that we can work off of that. Number four, infants get jaundiced. What is that scary word, jaundiced? Jaundice essentially is when the skin is a little bit more yellow. It is caused by something called bilirubin buildup. We call it hyperbilirubinemia. And essentially, bilirubin is a byproduct of red blood cell. And when your system's immature, you don't have it turn over as much. So it's easily built up in your serum, also known as your blood. When it's a very high level that becomes a little bit slightly concerning, the baby turns really yellow because it starts manifesting on the skin. And so um, you'll see it like the left-hand picture, that cute, well-fed, cheeky boy, um, but he's a little bit yellow and he looks Hispanic, but he looks almost Asian in that photograph. That's when you know, oh, we need to keep an eyeball on that jaundice. In the hospital, they might run a device over your baby if they start to look a little bit jaundice um, called transcutaneous device that detects a bilirubin. Um, the most accurate is always serum, meaning blood. We do have to poke the baby to make sure that they're okay. Because if they do pass a certain threshold of a number for their age range, they might need something called phototherapy. Cue the picture on the right. I like to call it um, the baby Miami sunbed light. Essentially, this is using fluorescent light to help break down the bilirubin in the body to be easily digested on a molecular level through the stools and the poop, the peas and the poop, the peas and the poop. Um, and that expedites the process a little bit more. Um, nonetheless, uh, certain categories are a little bit more high risk. So if you're East Asian, I will be honest, anecdotally, my African Americans, not as much, but I would say about 30 to 50%. And then my Hispanic babies, oh yeah, Hispanic babies, if not 50% of my Hispanics, they're usually a little bit jaundice. Um, and we're just at risk. It's genetic factors. It's nothing that you're doing. It's just inevitable. Um, it's built in our genes. And this is why we have these pro protocols in place to keep your baby safe. Um, so they may or may not need phototherapy. And this is not to say everyone's going to, even though you are, a I've had Asian babies, they're the highest risk factors and they didn't need phototherapy and they were breastfed. Um, and it's simply because breast milk, there's a delay in the breakdown with when you're breastfed versus formula fed in the bilirubin. It doesn't mean that it's, we negate breast milk at all. It means that we just have to keep a closer eye on that baby, okay? Um, and so this may or may not happen. That's the whole point of the slide is saying, don't be shocked if this does occur. And if 
what if may they don't reach that threshold for phototherapy they they don't reach that certain number for that age of life to get that beautiful miami light to expedite the uh bilirubin to be pooped out and peed out what 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 do we do well we feed your child that's what i was talking about that every single two to three hours the more you feed that child the more goes into that gut the quicker you get that bile out through the poop and the pee and the bile is what kind of carries the bilirubin um so the more no one will be more interested in poops and peas than i will be all right um and i'll talk about the normality of how much poops they should have and how much peas they should have if you're a breastfeeder because that's the feedback I get is, well, how much do I know is going in if, if I'm breastfeeding because I can't measure it? Well, we'll talk about output, meaning bowel movements and pee-pees and numbers of what diaper. Um, so that's essentially what jaundice is when I talked about it in the last slide of infants get jaundice. You can have you can have Caucasian babies get it. Um, I've had so many, I have a couple of Caucasian babies where um, both parents are Caucasian, there's no Asian descent, Hispanic descent at all, and that baby was simply jaundiced and they needed a little bit of phototherapy, and then we were, we just ate breast milk the whole time and we got the, their levels to go down, all right? But if that's relevant to you, we will talk about that at that first visit, otherwise, don't stress over it. Holy guacamole, May. If that is all normal, what is normal then? Actually, this is a good question. This is actually how I look right now with the pandemic. Um, I question what is normal every single day of my life, and I often feel like I'm living in a, a prolonged dream. So when you wake up, can someone else wake me up? All right, all joking aside, head shapes. So let's talk a little bit about head shapes. Um, I love this photograph. So this is where the an kind of anatomy class comes in. So I always say that you're MOM, your MD, your NP, your PA. You guys become physicians all of a sudden. Um, here is head shapes, and I'll, prom I'll tell you why it's important in just a second. You have two different fontanelles. So you see that big hole in the in the in the front of the head that's called anterior fontanelle that one closes around 24 months two years of life um, that needs to stay open and then you have the back one posterior fontanelle and that one closes about six to eight weeks by that two month period and then you have these beautiful sutures so you have the sagittal suture so in the middle and then you have the um coronal suture and also the um the front as well that is not shown in the temporal one as well and so with this said these are growth plates they're not sutures as if you're suturing a wound right they're actually growth plates so that's one jargon i apologize i'm using right now that one mom um distinctively asked me she's like what's a suture um they're just spaces in between growth plates i need those there i don't want it fused shut and the reason why you don't want to fuse shut is because if it's shut and those fontanelles or the holes in layman terms are closed the brain can't grow. It's going to be small, and that's a medical emergency. The brain has to grow for uh, full development. I caught one as early as, I believe it was four weeks of life, um, where it was fused completely closed. It's called a craniosynitosis, um, and that's a surgical emergency where we had to contact neurosurgery immediately and schedule an appointment and surgical places and our uh, procedures in place to open up that cranium, and then we do close follow-ups to make sure that it's closing appropriately and not too soon. That was one out of the thousands of patients that we have. Seldom do you come by this. I would say it's one to three percent of our patient population in the areas. I'm not not in the area, but in our practice at least. Um, and so I would not be overly concerned about that. And we detect that for you. But the reason why I see this photograph is really important is because that baby will look super different from minutes after birth to hours after birth. They look like a smushed baby in the beginning. Faces flat. They got a little bit of cone head. And then 24 hours later, their heads remold, reshapes, gets round. Um, I had a father in room one at our old practice who came over to me and he's like, is this cone head going to go away? It was a vaginal delivery, guys. I mean, look at, I, I, I looked at him and I was like, oh, the cone head? Oh, and that baby was like, I think 48 to six, 68 hours out of after birth. So less than three days of life. Um, I said, where did he come out of? Out from? Look at how petite she is and look how small the area is. Of course there's going to be a cone head. Um, hours afterwards, it's going to remold because that little baby has to fit through the tiny canal. Um, and that's why these plates are in place because it might shift to protect the brain. Um, it can override each other. So to come out of that tiny location and then it remolds, meaning everything goes back into place. And there might be some mild swelling as well because it's a it's a, a inflammatory process giving birth, your your temperature goes up, you're, you're going through trauma essentially to deliver your beautiful baby. Um, so never underestimate that process and it's amazing thing what your body can do for a woman. 
molding. This is what I like to say. Here's a, a perfect live still photograph of this. Um, they have a smushed face. They got that cone head. This baby is not an alien. It is indeed a human. Um, it will remold. I won't be worried. Super cute. Sometimes you might have something called a cephalohematoma. And cephalohematoma essentially is fluid collection in between the skin and the cranium itself. Um, and oftentimes you see this on the side to the back of the head. And it's simply because I call it my bumpy ride. So you can be a C-sectioner and still have this. You can be a vaginal delivery and the OB has to grip the baby in a certain position, their fingers on a certain place of the cranium because they need to deliver the baby and protect the mom and keep everyone alive safely. There could be a little bit more applied pressure. Um, or it can be a forcep assisted delivery or a vacuum assisted delivery if there's a little bit of a failure, um, if you will, in, in what I like to call they're stuck in the canal sometimes. Um, that's when you might see a cephalohematoma. It could be spontaneous as well, to be honest. You don't have to have a bumpy ride story to acquire this. It's totally benign. It is not a mass, a tumor by any means. Um, this is what usually panics my parents um, because you can't see it. Most commonly, you can't see it in the first 24 hours after delivery. You might find it like three days after delivery and there's this mild loculated fluid. It's it's very, it's um, when you touch it, it feels like a pocket fluid beneath. It doesn't hurt. It's not calcified. I mean, it's not a bony it's not a bony structure by lesion by any means. Um, it's normal. It actually reabsorbs. And it's, think about a tennis player, right? So you're playing tennis over and over and over and over again. The swelling doesn't happen right after you end the match. It's going to happen maybe that later that night or maybe two days later. You get that swelling, that bursitis that happens at the elbow. Um, and But by no means is that is that detrimental to your living. And so that baby, that fluid will reabsorb, but it does take sometimes as late as three to four months, but I promise you by four months, roughly at that point, 99.9% .9 of the cases usually are resolved. So I am not worried about this. This is not warrant a neurosurgeon or neurology to be on board or any imaging watch the baby. They're usually developing just fine and normal and it's unilateral in presentation, which is fine. Um, cord care. I love cord care. Uh, in the beginning, when you see it, that's the main vessel where the baby is getting blood, is being fed, and is surviving and thriving. And so with this said, oftentimes it's that fleshly color. It almost looks like a string cheese, very gooey. Uh, you'll never eat string cheese again. And I like to say this because if there's no blood flow, there's no growth. And so it ends up, look, there's no blood. You clamp the cord, right? And then after that, they remove the cord. Um, not the cord, but the cord clamp, and it ends up into that second bubble from top on right, and it looks like a little bit of a scab. Um, and so you essentially, this takes about two to three weeks for full resolution to fall off, sometimes three weeks maximum. If it ever branches to three to four weeks, um, meaning into four, the third, late third to fourth week, that's when I want you to phone call me um, because we will cauterize it or chemical, I don't like that word burn, but chemical, ch chemical burn it off, if you will. That's what um, silver nitrate is called, and it does not hurt the child. It's the same active ingredient that we use in tonsillectomy, uh, meaning removing your tonsillectomy. And so it is basically stopping um, any type of further growth on there. But with the set, it, it slowly falls off. And every time you, you see us in the office, we're going to push back on the cord a little bit. You don't touch it. No alcohol, no powder, nothing goes over it, no gauze no band-aids absolutely nothing you want to air dry it as much as possible the more you dry it off the more it's going to dry and peel off the quicker the cord falls off and as a result of that you might see some green yellow drainage sometimes it's not pus it's not infectious at all it's normal umbilical drainage and you might see some um mild mild uh mild mild um bleeding as well totally normal as well um and so with that said this takes about three to four weeks and before I move on I think some people joined late um, and just as a little bit of a reiteration uh, if you have any questions because all of this stuff is a little bit weird huh these are all normal uh, please go ahead and put it in the comments and if you joined late like let's say I, I joined 30 minutes late into the talk and you already ended the talk May um, put the question in the comment section I will still get that alert and I'll be happy to answer it within 24 hours okay okay this is a live picture. I 
love this photograph. The left side is my favorite. Look at how cheesy that thing is. Looks like a string cheese, huh? Um, you're gonna go ahead and be like, ooh, that was gross, and I love it. Maybe that's why I'm, Leanne just almost uh, puked next to me. She's like, no, that's not a string cheese, and I love my string cheese, and this is not string cheese, and it's gross. Um, make that stop now. Uh, I have ruined your string cheese from now on, haven't I? Nonetheless, guys, look at that vein and artery. So most commonly, now you gotta sometimes have a two vessel cord, but it's usually a three vessel cord. You have two arteries, so that's the two red and then one blue. It's so cool to see it in person. Um, and so you clamp that cord. See that little cord, that clamp right there? We gotta clamp it so then you can stop any type of, uh, that baby is no longer dependent on it. They're out, of the, they're out of the body. And after you clamp it, you cut the cord. And so some OBs might be like, hey dad, you wanna cut this? And like, yeah, let me cut that cord. Uh, that could happen. And after you remove the cord clamp and you allow it to dry a little bit remember what I said no blood no flow no growth and so it turns into that scab on the right hand side of the picture and what I love the most about this photograph is that the parent is folding the diaper down who's having a boy well Let's be honest, girls have a good aim too. Um, I, I can't tell you why, I'm gonna stick a camera in there one day and figure it out, maybe with my own child. Um, and so, with this said, they have good aim in getting peas and poops everywhere. By tucking the diaper down, you can prevent the pee and the poop from getting into the umbilical area. Um, because remember that I said that the best way is to let it air dry. The quicker you air dry, the quicker the cord falls off. Once upon a time, once in a while, I'll always get a panic call. May my baby peed into the, and and, and it squirted up. I, I moved the Twinkie down and it squirted up again. It's inevitable. Boys always do that. Little baby erections. It's totally normal too. Um, if, you've, if you're a female, you never know about it. And now you know if you have a boy. And so with that said, it's sterile, guys. You're, it's a closed loop system. You got breast milk and formula. Um, and it, it's, it's harmless to the child. Clean the area with a little soap and water. Dry it as best as you can and leave it open to air. Um, if it's truly infected, you see that area around the umbilical cord? That area will be red, inflamed, warm to touch. If you touch it, the baby will scream bloody murder. Um, and that's when there's an infection around that site. Seldom, less, I, we have never had it in our office. Seldom does it occur. Okay, because like I said, everything is sterile, but once in a while, in one in a million cases, you might have it in the hospital. Okay, now what else do we like to talk about? Other question and topic that a lot of my parents like to know about is skincare. I like to talk about skin, I love skin so much. Um, all right, so skincare the, the more, if you will, the less maintenance, the better. Um, so, the more traditional, the better. So, I like to go with low so gentle soft products without any alcohol and also un, no scented um so cetaphil uh eucerin aquaphor is my favorite vaseline's my my favorite walita um the what is that working honest company brand as well is also well tolerated um in many of our patients the photograph on the right lower hand side that might begin with johnson and end with johnson they're great i love them but they're scented um and often when you look back there's additional ingredients including alcohol in them that um, might exacerbate the dryness of the skin of the baby and further produce more cracks and um risk for any type of superficial cuts that can lead to infections of which we do not want. Um, I tend to like to do, go for non-water-based products such as Cetaphil cream, a vino cream, um, the Aquaphor, the Vaseline, because the more lotions are water-based, so that is going to evaporate quickly and cool down the skin and dry it out some more. We are in a transition period, I'm not going to lie. Um, we're, we're branching into summer at some point, so there'll be days where it's super hot. That's a day I'm going to use some lotion all right so if it's 90 degrees and let's say we're going to hawaii and it's about 100 degrees ugh, what i would do to be in hawaii but let's say we're in hawaii right now and it's 100 degrees that might be a good day to use a lotion unscented lotion all right like set a fill or something um just so we can cool down the baby because we don't want to overheat them anyways all right okay so these are normal skin rash this is the number one question I've, i think i've had three of these newborn questions in the span of like back-to-back -back visits where it's like skin 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 and it was all the same thing it's called see that blotchiness a lot of people get nervous because as a blotchy base and sometimes they might have some postular papules that means that cystic pimple like uh, lesion on top of the blotchy base but it doesn't bother the baby it's just cosmetically concerning and you think the number one response i always get is is this an allergic reaction do we have to get an EpiPen or Benadryl to the baby no don't do that with a baby. This is a normal newborn skin rash called um, 
erythema toxicum. You might hear people uh, call it short-term etox. It's I don't know why someone said toxicum because it, it's not toxic at all. It's just hormonal. It's from all of mama's hormones. This goes away after 14 days. Um, you might see neonatal acne, which is almost like the baby has infant acne, infantile acne, um, that reemerges at weeks two to four weeks of life, especially if they are breastfeeders, um, because all of a sudden they're taking in from two ounces to four ounces of breast milk and increasing in that hormonal intake. Totally normal. These things do not bother, neither irritate the child, um, and it just looks it looks concerning and cosmetically unpleasant, but that baby is fine. In about 14 days plus, give or minus time, it will go away, I promise you. All right, let's talk about fingernails. Um, man, man, talk, talk about fingernails and toenails now that the salons are closed. I like to say that I'm baptizing you guys to be the new salon artist and nail filist, manicurist, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so I don't like clipping our baby's nails because you can nip the nail bud. And skin is so thin, the epidermis is so thin with all the vasculature that is superficial, meaning top to the surface, you can you can just rupture a vessel and lead to bleeding at this point. So our ideal route is always filing it down and buffering it like the right-handed picture. So I like to file it down, but sometimes it can cause that to be a little bit more blunt and sharp, even though it's shorter in length. So you gotta buffer it. See that white edge? That's when I soften it a little bit. And sometimes you might even need to soak it. Um, the, the number one time I like to do it is during feeds. Feeds is really great because a baby's soothing. The, if you do it, please don't ever do it when the baby's sleeping. Oh my lord, when the baby's sleeping, go to sleep. You go to, you rest as well, all right? Because that little baby dragon will wake up very soon. Um, you want to do it when they're kind of awake and soothing themselves. So that's when they're feeding, either on the breast or through a bottle, because when they're upset, they're going to suck more. So increasing milk transfer and efficiency. Um, you don't want them at the breast for all day long. Otherwise, they're going to burn more calories than they're consuming. So that's a good time to do it. And it's only as needed, meaning if they have wolverine nails and it's variable. Some kids have it, some kids don't. Um, and it, there's no direct cause towards it, not because it's something you're eating or what, what, what matter. Um, but if you will, if it's long and they're scratching their Face, it's time to file it down and then buffer it. And those are little pro tips I have for you. Sex differences. Okay. Um, before I go on, I, I mentioned it a couple slides ago, but if you had any questions about certain things with the nails or the, or the skin or the body products, feel free to leave it in the comments and I will get back to it because there is a little bit of a lag time in between which people are joining and um, hearing the messages of what I'm delivering. And I might have uh, passed your slide 10 slides ago, um, but I'll be happy to get back to the comments even at the conclusion of the talk. Okay, let's get back to sex differences. So sex differences, boys and girls, a little bit different for each, right? And so I just like to talk about some normals. Um, for girls and boys, you might see a little bit of blood in their diaper sometimes. Don't be alarmed. Remember what I told you that uh, this talk is about? It's it's talking about expecting the unexpected. Who would have ever thought that you would have some blood in your baby's diaper to be normal? Um, and so that's actually really normal in the first two weeks of life. Even I've seen it up until three months, but it's intermittent. It's like once in a blue moon, um, especially if they're breastfeeding. Um, but oftentimes it's from hormones. It might be as red as a ladies. It's like spotting for your menses. It could be as red as that, but it's not a continual flow. All right, don't get me wrong. It's just spotting at this point. Um, but usually it's a bit of an orange tinge splatter and that's about it. And it ends in 14 days of life um, because they regulate with the hormones a little bit more from post utero or post nadir. Um, and so that's normal. And then the second thing is ladies might have a little bit of white cheesy drainage. I like to call it leucorrhea. This is not for you mamas. It's for the papas. Because I always get them in the office and they go, man, there's some white stuff in the, in her vagina. Is that okay? And the moms are sitting in the back of the, of the room rocking. They're like, I already told him it's normal. I get it too. And he won't listen to me. It's absolutely normal. It's leucorrhea from hormones. You usually see it go away by at least two, three months um, after they're being born in the breast milk hormones are being regulated well and everything kind of plateaus um, and so that's normal um, so that's ladies um, might see some white drainage to the vagina totally normal boys you might see some breast yeah it's called gynecomastia breast um, up until like that two month period and then it goes away it's all from that hormone if they're breastfeeding it might be a little bit more prolonged but it's nothing permanent so don't don't fret about that papas um, that's the number one question and concern i always get and the last but not least I'm going to talk about is circumcision. Uh, circumcision is, I, I take a very diplomatic approach on this because there's no right or wrong answer. And I stand with the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, 
I always hear this, should we do it, should we not do it? Um, there's really two, three reasons that it, it boils down to, or two, three top, top factors that I go to. Number one is religion. Okay, and then number two is fam familial preference. So mom and dad, I, I see what you guys prefer. And the third is medical. So the AAP or American Academy of Pediatrics um, position statement on this is there's enough evidence that demonstrates that circumcisions are safe to be done, meaning the benefits outweigh the risk where it can be done so there's no harm if you elect to move forward with it. If it was harmful, we would not do it. We would not offer it as an elective surgery after birth. Um, and then, But two, hold on, there's a second bifold statement with this is um, there's insufficient evidence that makes it as a requirement for standard of care, meaning if you don't move forward with it, it's totally fine. I, I bet you there's a ton of men out there that are uncircumcised, that are totally normal. What needs to come out of it will come out. What needs to go, what it needs to go into, it will go into. Um, so it's totally functional. Uh, so again, it's really that religion. So I have a lot of Jewish patients in my office and they, they wait till, they have a ceremony over this, I believe at that week of life. Um, and I have some familiar preference just because they prefer it. And that's your baby, absolutely, you know them the most and that's fine. And the third piece was that medical piece. And they're like, well, what's the medical piece? This is extreme. Um, so for example, Let's say I have a baby with a single kidney um, that we detected in utero, and it's it's a, it's a, it's highly inflamed. So there's a reflux, meaning um, it's a hydronephrosis stage four, where that PP just backs right back up, um, and it's a male. Um, would a circumcision decrease the risk for a future UTI? Yeah, it might. And so that's something that we need to sit down and talk about and talk about if the benefits outweigh the risk and if you like to move forward with it. But I can tell you that I know one that is uncircumcised and they're doing just fine. Um, so it really requires that conversation and that input that you might have as well. But there is definitely insufficient evidence that says there's a firm yes and no as a requirement and a standard of care for all babies. Okay, so it's a little bit of a diplomatic approach. I'm always happy to have that conversation with you if you, if you ever want to talk through it. Okay, all right. The next hot topic, sleep. I love to talk about sleep. It is a, a big ordeal for everyone because if you think about it, you all have had six to eight hours, if not more, of sleep before your chicken nugget will be here. Um, your sleep will be disturbed to two, three hours. That first week is called adrenaline rush and honeymoon for some of you guys. And then that first week for the other people are called a reality, um, a, a little bit of a reality breaking point, if you will, and you didn't know how much you need more than two hours of sleep at an increment to function at your best level. Um, and so I wanted to kind of, I, I believe that talking through things, if you talk about healthy expectation, it doesn't bring as much disappointment. And sleep is your baby will be a little bit awake after that 24 hours of discharge um, at nighttime. And that's totally normal. And the reason why is because they need to grow. They don't stay that same size. Every day they grow grow by at least half to one ounce. In order to acquire that, they must eat. And so it's normal for them to wake up at night and have that day-night sleep um, flip-flop, if you will, because for nine months, eight, nine months, they never lifted a finger to be fed. They just passively fed like a Roman god or a Roman goddess in utero and everything was done for them until they were delivered and now they have to work for it. So oftentimes they miss a couple of feedings in the daytime because they quote unquote sleep during the daytime and wake up at nighttime, eh? And I, that's the number one thing I hear all the time. And I was like, yes, they're like baby cats. They lay in the sun all day long and then they realize, oh Lord, I miss breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I gotta make up for it. And they do it at night when they, the body markers hemodynamically reaches those mark of I need to be hydrated as an alarm system them to make them well fed so that's normal um, and that first night is always a little bit of a rougher edge as you're easing into that new adjustment of waking up every two three hours to feed that baby and if that baby doesn't wake up you must wake them up and feed them okay to ensure for their safety um, and then this usually plateaus around that three to four week mark it gets a little bit better and the nighttime sleeping um, starts to have longer stretches and by stretches I mean like an extra hour at this point and then it regulates hopefully by that two three month period when they get four hours of sleep if not a little bit more but variable because it depends on what they're eating so breast milk babies um, will, will probably wake up a little bit more often and it also depends on breast milk production and 
everyone's breastfeeding journey is highly different. The key is how's the baby doing and how's the schedule working for you? So we're doing a tango together. Um, but it's normal that they're up at 2 a.m. sometimes, if not at 1 a.m. Um, I hesitate to show this graph. This graph basically just gives you a general facade of how much the baby sleeps in the beginning. So that day-night sleep time is should be equivalent. They're up every two, three hours. And then by that one month period, they drop just slightly off the daytime sleeping and they sleep a little bit longer, like half an hour to one hour, extra long stretches at nighttime. And then by three, four months, it definitely turns a curve. And six months, we're in a better routine. And hopefully they do mostly night sleeping by the time they are one, two year of age. I talk about night sleeping because I like to talk about baby on back. Um, in 1994, as you can see, we highly, well, 1992, we realized that babies have to sleep on back because the SID rate was just way too high by the AP. And in 1994, we implemented it. Look at that dramatic fall. That's beautiful. Um, and so that reduced sudden infant death syndrome by sleeping on their back. Other things that reduce sudden infant death syndrome is no smoking um, it, because of immature lungs, and it's also just healthier for the parent as well. Um, and there's always, we call it secondhand, and there's there's such a thing called thirdhand smoking too, where that smoke can be reserved on your clothing and the baby can inhale it. Why? Because they're on you all the time, either breastfeeding, burping, or resting. Um, and so we, we try not to do smoking as best as we can. I had one beautiful mom who stood up to me after, I think, I think the second newborn class that I taught and she said, you know, I do I, I smoke and we worked with her OB on smoking cessation before the delivery and she has not smoked since then. Her baby is now two years of age. Excellent. Um, so I applaud her for doing that and there's absolutely, absolutely no shame or guilt. Separate sleeping place is always very important um, so that you don't strangulate or suffocate the baby in case if you just, you're so tired and you might roll over to the baby and so we don't want to do that one. Uh, do not allow infants to sleep in swings or cushions. When you do that overnight, I know you're desperate because that tells me you're trying to find an inter interval babysitter. Uh, remember the car seat thing I told you about? How in high velocity, that car seat swing is going to push the head forward and you can obstruct airway. Absolutely not safe. Are they going to like a flat surface on the crib? No. No, absolutely not. If you've slept in a duvet at the Hilton Hotel for nine months, is sleeping on a porch in the tent gonna be comfortable? No, absolutely not. But it keeps you alive. Um, and that baby's going to be waking up, which is good. Um, and we wanna make sure that their airway is maintained. So absolutely, there is some adjustment towards it. So healthy expectation to know that it's coming our way, that it's going, and that's why I also love the SNOO um, and look into it. And the SNOO is S-N-O-O. -O, um, it is a safe infant approved um, bassinet that kind of sometimes helps swing the baby if they wake up crying at very slow increments until they go back to sleep and it slows down and it works for a lot of our patients. No heavy blankets. I talked about that in the first couple of slides because it causes overheating and baby back to sleep. I hit that in the head many times, so I'm going to move away from that now. Um, and so the first feedback I get is usually from the grandparents and they say, well, May, I don't want to do tummy time. Oh, no, I don't want to do baby on back because I'm going to have a flat head for my baby. And I don't want my baby to have a flat head. You can, it's essentially, it's called congenital plagiocephaly, that beautiful word on top with that flattening of head. Um, and unless if it becomes a very debilitating structure where that baby can now not, let's say it's dramatically, uh, the head is just not proportional um, and it's causing the baby to have a tilted head, then we might have to consider helmets. Um, but before that, if it's just simply a flat head like that top photograph, um, it's not always a, it's definitely not surgical, surgically recommended to have an intervention for that because it's purely cosmetic. It will not intervene with development. And B, you can avoid all, all of this with tummy time. In that second slide or third slide, I told you guys that the head remolds up until 24 months of age range. So you might have some congenital plagiocephaly you're born with because that's how you were sh uh, you were nudged in the womb for eight, nine months in a, in a weird position on a certain surface that made your head flat, and that's fine. Um, it will remold up in 24 months. I had one and I say, hey, take a photograph, bird's eye view, and then on the side and from the top to, of the back of the head for me once a month on the same day, the first Monday of every single month. And I wanna let you know that you're not gonna see any differences in the first six months. After six months, that baby's gonna be up and at it. They wanna roll around. And then by 24 months, they never have 
time sleeping on their back because they just want to be up and at it. They want to be developmentally aware and associating with their environment. And that allows time for their head to remold. And I avoid that by implementing them on the tummy time sooner once that cord falls off. So you see that beautiful picture on the lower right. I believe that baby belongs to someone in this office and he's 13 now. Oh my goodness. So cute, super cute back then. But that's excellent core motor control. So see that head, how he's lifting it up? You're working on that head neck exercising and that core control. I love it. Um, this baby is beautiful. Everything about it is beautiful. Um, the helmet is super cute, but I dare you to guess the price of that helmet. That helmet ranges into thousands of dollars. I mean, three thousand to six thousand dollars guys and guess what you have to do you have to remold that head at least two different helmets at least and you're in there for the first two to four weeks measuring that baby's head to get the right size helmet um, and it essentially forces certain parts um, with metal to not metal but hard structures so that it doesn't grow in, in horizontally and it pushes the head to grow up towards the back vertically um, and it's really unnecessary if you hear my favorite um, not unnecessary but it's not required and as a standard for their development or anything for their thriving needs because it's really your my favorite surgeons talked about it dr uh, Macero and Dr. McClintock, the neurologist, said there's really two reasons if it's not a craniosynitosis that I talked about in that third or fourth slide in the beginning. It's really for two reasons. So A, it's for cosmetic needs, and B, for parental anxiety. Um, and if I could bypass a couple of thousand dollars, it would be great. I don't think that we need to pay one year of tuition at UVA for shaping of the baby's head if the baby is growing well and developing just fine. And we can avoid a lot of this um, economic cost through tummy time just like that baby Aiden right there um what was I going to say does insurance cover for this no um, it has to meet all of these criteria. and um, if you think that you know I get that phone call well my insurance told me that it does and I was like yeah did you ask for the criteria there's a lot of and ors in there they have to be IUGR and they have to do this and they have to have that and this and they will not cover for it I have not had one patient that cut except for Medicaid with any type of syndromes, like Down syndrome, um, then they will go ahead and cover for that. But if you're not Medicaid and you're commercial, um, their likelihood is very low, unfortunately. That's a lot of things to worry about, especially in a time and age like today. Oh my goodness me, I'm worried about everything. Don't trust me. I'm worried about there not being enough onions at the grocery store. Um, apparently people are just buying it and I don't know, maybe they're wiping their bums with it these days because there's no more toilet paper. Who knows? Ah, moving on, but what should we worry about? The, the, memorize this, take a photograph of this, do something with this, write it down. Um, this is when you should be worried. A, you should be worried when your baby has a fever. And when I say fever, so there's several things we have to talk about. A, I want 100.4 and or higher um, rectally. You heard me right. I want a rectal thermometer. This is the first part we kind of, uh, if you will, kind of misuse a lot of times. I get a phone call, my baby has a fever and they've been swaddled in the winter in a velvet coat. Or no, my favorite was we went out to cherry blossoms. It was 80 degrees. Um, this was last year, not this year because social distancing is important. Uh, but last year we, we, we went out to cherry blossoms. Guys, it was 80 degrees last year and they were in a velvet onesie with a onesie with a cotton onesie beneath and a blanket on top. I think I'm going to have a fever too. And they took it axillary, meaning through the armpit and through the forehead. You will be hot that way. That's not an accurate measurement. I want a rectal thermometer because it tells me the core temperature of that baby. Why am I so nitpicky about this? And a rectal thermometer is, there's they sell it online. They sell it at the stores, put it on your register um, half an inch to an inch into the rectum, meaning the, um, for lack of better term, the bum hole, the anus. Uh, it's important that we do it because a fever is a medical emergency in anyone less than 60 to 90 days of life. Um, I do not take it lightly. If they have a fever, they don't even come into the office. They, come, they go straight to the emergency room. Um, that baby will debilitate quickly with a fever. If you and I don't feel good with a fever, a temperature of 99.5, you best bet someone who's less than 90 days of life would sustain for a long time. And they'll be very fussy because you're hot and inflamed. Um, 
systemically you're flared up and so with that said no not tympanic meaning not the ear not the temporal not the forehead not the armpit i want a rectal thermometer when you're in the hospital in the newborn unit and they use the armpit one sure you've got all you've got people who have 12 hour shifts they've had at least six hours of sleep coming in to take care of your baby um, they can know when they touch the baby who's tactically febrile and they confirm it with a digital marker and they have all the crash car um, necessary equipments for vitality within arm's reach but when you're at home i want a car core temperature when you have none of that you're sleep deprived you're exhausted and there's a lot of other variables so 100.4 rectally um, and when you call I want you to call us first and if you call us I actually am on the phone and I tell you to unbundle the child I actually tell you how's the child looking if they're fine and stable unbundle the child and I want you to get a rectal thermometer with me on the phone one more time and if they truly have a fever I will call you into the emergency room the pediatric emergency room we never go to adult mer mer emergency room for kids never I want a pediatric facilities because little kid doctors takes care of little kids big doctors takes care of big people um, B, trouble breathing. That's highly variable. So trouble breathing means is extreme. So that's breathing 60 times per minute. <laughs> that was only six breaths, guys. If I did that for 60 times in one minute, I would lose my breath and pass out. Um, so it's really extreme. If it's transient, <laughs> stops. You might hear a little bit of that. That's normal. Um, and it's just because the central nervous system and the pulmonary system, meaning the lungs, is not fully matured. So you're going to see some transient uh, quickened breath, and it slows down. And it's usually when they're sleeping and late at night. Sometimes they might even be on you at that point. And that's fine as long as it's not sustained after 12 seconds, okay? Uh, or, or a minute, my apologies. Um, you just want to make sure that they're not breathing 60 times per minute and they're struggling to breathe. If they are, then that's when you call. we have to call 911, all right? Voiding means um, putting out a wet diaper, um, less than five to six wet diapers a day. That's, that's with a caveat. Um, and so here's the trick, guys. How do I know how much I'm putting in my baby is enough? What if they're just dehydrated because I'm not giving enough my baby because I'm breastfeeding? Um, number of days of life is a number of wet diapers they should have. So one day of life, one wet diaper. Two days of life, two. Three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six. Stop counting after six, they're well hydrated. Um, so stop counting after six. The five to six is let's say they're three, four weeks old now and they've only had two wet diapers in 24 hours. That's significantly dehydrated. Um, that's when I would be worried for that child. And there's no reason, let's say the milk is established at that point or we're bottle feeding and they're just not drinking well and they're very, they, they have no appetite, they're hard to stir and they only have two wet diapers. That's a medical emergency. Last but not least is subjective irritability and lethargy. Lots of babies cry because they either need to be fed, they're gassy, they need to be consoled and contained in a swaddle, um, or they need to suck on something, and that's normal too. Um, but irritability is like a baby who has been screaming bloody murder for 24 hours, nothing consoles them, food doesn't console them, and they're just very uncomfortable, they're not acting normal, and they're super jaundiced. That's when you call me. And then lethargy is the opposite extreme. So that's if the baby is hard to awaken, it's been six hours, it's daytime and nighttime, they're not waking up to eat at all. They've had one wet diaper, this baby's seven days old. That's lethargy, okay? Eyes are rolling back and everything. So these are the extreme measures of which I am very, very concerned, and I would want you to call in the troops such as us, okay? This is the most important slide, so screenshot it, do whatever you need to do, print it out uh, to give you a good reference. Um, breastfed babies, so let's talk a little bit about what goes into our babies. So um, they can either be breastfed or formally fed exclusively for the first four to six months because AAP allows for solid introduction, not reliancy on the solids. It's not substituting breast milk or formula, it's, it's supplementing, and we toy with it around anywhere from four to six months for uh, texture and exposure, uh, but exclusively dominant feeding is all breast milk or formula up until six months in, of life um, and breastfed babies we love everyone loves that we always try to go with this route but it's not for everyone and that's okay everyone's journey is a little bit different um, I'll, I'll give you this reassuring piece um, all four of the providers are formula fed here and I like to say that we turned out pretty normal so there you go maybe uh, it's all reassuring but we do have studies that show that with breastfed baby they have lesser ear infection lesser respiratory symptoms, um, they have higher IQs, immune systems better boosted, less of eczema um, and rash development. So there are studies that justify that and telling the benefits of breast milk. Um, but formula feeding is fine 
two, you guys, totally fine. Um, if you would like to move forward with this or if we have to seesaw the baby, meaning um, sometimes the baby is has significant weight loss from the hospital um, and it's a large for gestational baby. Let's say it's a nine pounder. Let's just be extreme here, or a 10 pounder. Let's go crazy. Um, it's a 10 pound baby. They had like 13% weight loss. Milk is not in. It's a C-section baby. So milk takes a little bit uh, more time to come in because we didn't have the normal contraction through the vaginal canal delivery. And that's fine. It will come in. Um, and I've had C-sectioners with milk coming in at three to five days normal time. Um, so highly, highly variable from case to case. And so let's say if we do seesaw, seesaw means I supplement the baby. They get breast milk. They go to the breast first no matter what, but ensure their safety for to prevent dehydration. I top them off with maybe like half an ounce to an ounce of formula if we need to. Uh, we do everything, we're conservative, so we do everything we can before we cross this bridge if you elect to do breastfeeding first. Uh, but then some people are like, nah, I want to do formula feeding only. And that's fine too, but it can be overwhelming. There's a lot of formulas. Um, the trick is this, go standard. Enfamil, uh, or Similac, um, Earth's Best, they're all just fine. I don't want anything that is for um, soy, if you will, because it lacks certain protein chains or carbohydrate chains that's necessary for the brain growth. So if you ever branch off to the soy formulation or the special formulations, I want you to talk to me first um, it, because the standard formulation has everything that that baby needs for that brain growth to occur, DHA. Um, it, it's important um, for the baby's development in the future, okay? So I talked a little bit about knowing if it's working. So breastfeeding, what goes in will come out. So if I don't know how much I'm measuring in, the days of life is a urine output uh, or input to output. And then, so one day of life, one, and then two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six, and you stop at six. The poops goes a little bit like this. Um, if it, In the beginning, it's meconium. So it's black and tarry, and that's totally normal. It's sticky. Um, I want all of that out by three to four days of life if not sooner. Um, so the more you breastfeed, that colostrum in the beginning, even though it's not your milk hasn't come in yet, that brown fat acts like petroleum jelly and coats the meconium and lets it slide out of the gut. Um, so the more the merrier with that. Um, last but not least, in turn, the output should transition to about yellow CD watery stools, and that's beautiful. That is what I call milk and honey, and it's not diarrhea. It's simply because if you're breastfeeding the baby, it's more whey protein and also water content in the beginning since the mom's not eating as much, and that's normal. Otherwise, we really shouldn't be feeding anything else, like I said before. So no water, no juices, none of that stuff until we're six months of age and in minimal content because it's empty calories. Fills up the calories, doesn't give them the nu necessary nutrients and fats for appropriate growth. Um, but we'll talk about that at those later visits when we see your baby. Woof, what a fire hydrant that we just drank from. Um, this will be your guys, you guys, when you have teenagers and they grow up, and then you'll be teaching my class. I'm taking a prolonged sabbatical. I'm moving to Hawaii afterwards. I'm kidding. Um, but again, if you have any other questions of things that I talked about um, in the previous slides, jot them down, write them in the comment section, and I will be so happy to go ahead and address them. I want to also let you guys know that we do complimentary telehealth newborn visits called meet and greet and so you get to meet us um, and we get to meet you and we talk through things of expectations um, and we we even give you a little virtual uh, uh, tour of the office which is so nice without you having to come in here um, and then what to expect as well and we would love to meet you over telehealth or tele or what I like to call Doximity, um, a, a platform that is safe and secured uh, for us to talk to you about everything related to you and your baby along with their well-being. Um, but in the meantime, this does conclude our visit, or not our visit, but our virtual newborn class. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, just take everything, um, enjoy it. You don't have to memorize anything. This is going to be a very great experience. Um, you will have a beautiful baby. Baby, and we look forward to meeting that baby whenever he she arrives okay you guys stay safe during this season we look forward to meeting you soon um, but otherwise we hopefully can see you guys at some point when the office is we're doing full fledged in classes that will be very nice and I look forward to those days but um, be safe and I look forward to meeting you at that first visit or second visit okay bye guys the reason I question is that like a